increasingly formulated taboos against all marriages among near relatives. Religion has long been an effective barrier against outmarriage. Many religious teachings have prescribed marriage outside the faith. Woman has usually favored the practice of in marriage, man, outmarriage. Property has always influenced marriage, and sometimes, in an effort to conserve property within a clan, mores have arisen compelling women to choose husbands within their father's tribes. Rulings of this sort led to a great multiplication of cousin marriages. Inmating was also practiced in an effort to preserve craft secrets. Skilled workmen sought to keep the knowledge of their craft within the family. Superior groups, when isolated, always reverted to consanguineous mating. The Nodites, for over 150,000 years, were one of the great in marriage groups. The later day in marriage mores were tremendously influenced by the traditions of the violet race, in which, at first, matings were perforce between brother and sister. And brother and sister marriages were common in early Egypt, Syria, Mesopotamia, and throughout the lands once occupied by the Andites. The Egyptians long practiced brother and sister marriages in an effort to keep the royal blood pure, a custom which persisted even longer in Persia. Among the Mesopotamians before the days of Abraham, cousin marriages were obligatory. Cousins had prior marriage rights to cousins. Abraham himself married his half sister, but such unions were not allowed under the later mores of the Jews. The first move away from brother and sister marriages came about under the plural wife mores, because the sister wife would arrogantly dominate the other wife or wives. Some tribal mores forbade marriage to a dead brother's widow, but required the living brother to beget children for his departed brother. There is no biologic instinct against any degree of in marriage. Such restrictions are wholly a matter of taboo. Out marriage finally dominated because it was favored by the man. To get a wife from outside ensured greater freedom from in laws. Familiarity breeds contempt. So, as the element of individual choice began to dominate mating, it became the custom to choose partners from outside the tribe. Many tribes finally forbade marriages within the clan, others limited mating to certain castes. The taboo against marriage with a woman of one's own totem gave impetus to the custom of stealing women from neighboring tribes. Later on, marriages were regulated more in accordance with territorial residence than with kinship. There were many steps in the evolution of in marriage into the modern practice of out marriage. Even after the taboo rested upon in marriages for the common people, chiefs and kings were permitted to marry those of close kin in order to keep the royal blood concentrated and pure. The mores have usually permitted sovereign rulers certain licenses in sex matters. The presence of the later Andite peoples had much to do with increasing the desire of the Sangak races to mate outside their own tribes, but it was not possible for out mating to become prevalent until neighboring groups had learned to live together in relative peace. Out marriage itself was a peace promoter. Marriages between the tribes lessened hostilities. Out marriage led to tribal coordination and to military alliances. It became dominant because it provided increased strength. It was a nation builder. Out marriage was also greatly favored by increasing trade contacts. Adventure and exploration contributed to the extension of the mating bounds and greatly facilitated the cross fertilization of racial cultures. The otherwise inexplicable inconsistencies of the racial marriage mores are largely due to this out marriage custom with its accompanying wife stealing and buying from foreign tribes, all of which resulted in a compounding of the separate tribal mores. That these taboos respecting in marriage were sociologic, not biologic, is well illustrated by the taboos on kinship marriages. Which embraced many degrees of in law relationships, cases representing no blood relation whatsoever. 6. Racial Mixtures There are no pure races in the world today. The early and original evolutionary peoples of color have only two representative races persisting in the world the yellow man and the black man, and even these two races are much admixed with the extinct colored peoples. While the so called white race is predominantly descended from the ancient blue man, it is admixed more or less with all other races, much as is the red man of the Americas. 
Of the six colored Sangic races, three were primary and three were secondary. Although the primary races, blue, red, and yellow, were in many respects superior to the three secondary peoples, it should be remembered that these secondary races had many desirable traits which would have considerably enhanced the primary peoples if their better strains could have been absorbed. Present-day prejudice against half-castes, hybrids, and mongrels arises because modern racial cross-breeding is, for the greater part, between the grossly inferior strains of the races concerned. You also get unsatisfactory offspring when the degenerate strains of the same race intermarry. If the present-day races of Urantia could be freed from the curse of their lowest strata of deteriorated, antisocial, feeble-minded, and outcast specimens, there would be little objection to a limited race amalgamation. And if such racial mixtures could take place between the highest types of the several races, still less objection could be offered. Hybridization of superior and dissimilar stocks is the secret of the creation of new and more vigorous strains, and this is true of plants, animals, and the human species. Hybridization augments vigor and increases fertility. Race mixtures of the average or superior strata of various peoples greatly increase creative potential, as is shown in the present population of the United States of North America. When such matings take place between the lower or inferior strata, creativity is diminished, as is shown by the present-day peoples of southern India. Race blending greatly contributes to the sudden appearance of new characteristics, and if such hybridization is the union of superior strains, then these new characteristics will also be superior traits. As long as present-day races are so overloaded with inferior and degenerate strains, race intermingling on a large scale would be most detrimental. But most of the objections to such experiments rest on social and cultural prejudices rather than on biological considerations. Even among inferior stocks, hybrids often are an improvement on their ancestors. Hybridization makes for species improvement because of the role of the dominant genes. Racial intermarriage increases the likelihood of a larger number of the desirable dominants being present in the hybrid. For the past hundred years, more racial hybridization has been taking place on Urantia than has occurred in thousands of years. The danger of gross disharmonies as a result of cross-breeding of human stocks has been greatly exaggerated. The chief troubles of half-breeds are due to social prejudices. The Pitcairn experiment of blending the white and Polynesian races turned out fairly well because the white men and the Polynesian women were of fairly good racial strains. Interbreeding between the highest types of the white, red, and yellow races would immediately bring into existence many new and biologically effective characteristics. These three peoples belong to the primary Sangic races. Mixtures of the white and black races are not so desirable in their immediate results Neither are such mulatto offspring so objectionable as social and racial prejudice would seek to make them appear. Physically, such white-black hybrids are excellent specimens of humanity, notwithstanding their slight inferiority in some other respects. When a primary Sangic race amalgamates with a secondary Sangic race, the latter is considerably improved at the expense of the former. And on a small scale, extending over long periods of time, there can be little serious objection to such a sacrificial contribution by the primary races to the betterment of the secondary groups. Biologically considered, the secondary Sangics were in some respects superior to the primary races. After all, the real jeopardy of the human species is to be found in the unrestrained multiplication of the inferior and degenerate strains of the various civilized peoples, rather than in any supposed danger of their racial interbreeding. Presented by the Chief of Seraphim stationed on Urantia.